don't be sorry. It's cool. I was drinking my wine, so it's all good. <laughs> That's you know, I was about to, to pour a little drink because there you go. Um, our classmates, we're at one of our classmates' houses and um she invited oh, everybody sweet. over. So we're just mixing and mingling, you know. Nice. How how awesome. So yeah, tell me about that. So you had orientation the last two days? Yes, at orientation. So yesterday was a full day. We did um eight to like five o'clock or four thirty. And it was basically us meeting like the faculty, uh, some of the administrative people, the assistant dean. We had a new dean. She just started um, yesterday as well. So that was her first day. Um, we met some of the DMP uh, students for um, nurse practitioner. It was neonatal nurse practitioners, family, and also acute care. And I think a couple of mental health. Yeah, I think it was mental health oh, was wow. there as well. So everyone. So, yeah, so everybody was there. And then um, today it was a lot of the technology stuff, how we take exams, which was interesting. And um, then we did like a more nurse anesthesia uh, focused kind of breakdown. And then we okay. went home. Well, actually, I didn't go home. I went to the library to study. And then, oh, nice. Getting a head start. <laughs> yeah. That's a good student. <laughs> Hey, yes, it's my class. Awesome. Well, how oh. exciting. So it's finally starting. That's so exciting. So I kind of yes. want to talk to you about your journey up until this point. Okay. Because um, so many people obviously want to be in your shoes. And so I just um, think what you have to share would be really valuable to them. Okay. Um, so kind of tell me what steps have you that you've taken so far to get into anesthesia school? Okay. So I uh, graduated in 2017 with my bachelor's in nursing at Coppin State University in Baltimore. And um, I jumped into the ICU right away. My first job was at a level one in the surgical ICU at uh, Medstar Washington Hospital Center, which is in DC, pretty big hospital. And um, that's what kind of jumpstarted everything. And uh, I did that for about nine months before I started studying for my CCRN. Um, so that way, by the time my year hit, I took the CCRN, got that out the way. And then I just kind of knocked things off my checklist. I actually reached out to my residency coordinator for my residency program at the time. And she set me up with a shadow day. So I shadowed a CRNA, um, loved it, loved it, loved it. <laughs> and uh, figured that I'm going to do a couple of more shadow days while I get everything else ready. And then in the meantime, I had to kind of hunt people down to get my um, references. And uh, once I got those done, then it was time to like submit because that was like the part that was holding me up the most because I had to rely on somebody else to kind of get everything done. Yes. But once I got that done, it was submit, submit, submit everywhere I could, everywhere I could. Awesome. And, okay. And uh, yeah, so that was pretty much it. How many schools did you actually apply to? Oof. It was over 10. It was a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. Was that was yeah, a lot, lot of references to get. Oh, I guess you probably reused a lot. You reused them, but you know, I did a lot because I knew for myself that I didn't have the highest GPA. Um, I hadn't taken the GRE already, so I knew that I wanted to give myself more, uh, better chances to get in on the first first round. So I figured if I had the money to apply, I would just apply. So um, some applications I started and then did not send. Um, others I just I sent. I got rejected to a lot, and I got uh, offered interviews to a lot too. So it was a good mixture, um, but I, I, I submitted to a lot to a lot. Okay. How long, how long have you known CRNA is what you wanted to do? And I guess, how did you know? Was it not until you went to the ICU? No, it was before then. So um, while I was in nursing school, I worked in the ER as a tech. And I always thought I was going to be an ER nurse. ER nurse, ER nurse, ER nurse. <laughs> and when I got to critical care, my um, clinical instructor, she, she pulled me to the side one day and she was like, well, what do you want to do with your life? And I was like, I don't know. What do you mean? She's like, where do you want to work? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to work in the ER. She's like, why? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. That's all I know. Honestly, she's like, you, didn't, you don't want to work in the ICU? I was like, well, I don't really know much about it. So she's like, well, you're doing your practicum with me in the ICU. So I was like, okay. So we were there uh, one night, and they had a critical airway. And uh, this lady came up, and everybody's all frantic on the unit. And she came up so calm and... Uh, went in there, she intubated the patient and kind of just disappeared. And I was like, who is that? And my uh, instructor, she was like, oh, that's uh, the nurse anesthetist. And I was like, what do, what do they do? And she kind of told me about it. And I was like, okay, I kind of like that. I like where this is going. So mm -hmm. um, I did a little bit more research and it was actually one of my 
coworkers who's actually a really good friend of mine now. She was already a nurse. And I kind of told her about it. And she's like, well, what are you waiting for? And I was like, well, I don't know anything else but the ER. I think I should just do ER. She's like, if you don't get out of the ER and go to the ICU and get this done. So that kind of broke me out of my comfort zone to say, okay, nice. I can do the ICU. So that's kind of cool. what put me on that, that path. Okay, awesome. That's a great story. That's awesome. All right. So and that kind of gets me back to like how long you had been preparing. So obviously it was pre-graduation and your BSN, you knew you wanted to do CRNA. So I guess that was ultimately your goal. So you spent the, after you graduated, you pretty much, um, I guess, how soon did you start preparing for the application process? And you said you took the CCRN at nine months. I took, so, no, I took it at 12 months, but I started studying at nine months. So I see. Nine, okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think I started preparing and actually like filling out applications and looking up schools. I want to say, uh, hmm, it was right after I shadowed. Uh, that was January of 2018. So I was like halfway through my first year, but when I really started to prepare things. So six months okay. in is when I started to, you know, find what schools I wanted to apply to um, gotcha. and kind of knock things off a checklist that I had made. So about six months okay. in, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. So by one year, I shouldn't have any holdups. You know, I can just submit everything. So in the moment, when did you gain your first interview after you had is that at your mark? Is that when you first started interviewing for school? Yeah. So my, my okay. first interview for school was at about it was november november of 2018 okay. so that was my my first interview at a union university okay. and i had previously um got exposed to union at a diversity and crna oh, yeah. event that passed april so i had knew the director i had knew some students who had gone there so i was really excited about it i was really mm -hmm. excited so that was my first interview and okay. that came after a lot of no's it came after a lot of Sorry, 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 you know, maybe next time. Like no time. interviews, no's? Yeah, yeah, it was a bunch oh. of no's to, to interview. So I, I was a little a little discouraged, but when that first one came through, I was it kind of gave me, like, some hope, so. Yeah, okay, and so diversity CRNA, tell me tell me about that, because I that's I see that a lot, and I'm kind of curious if you felt that really helped you, and kind of how did you hear about it, and um, I don't know, I'm just kind of curious about it, because I don't know much about it myself. So diversity CRNA is pretty much an initiative to um, make the playing field even in the anesthesia mm -hmm. community. Um, we're not as diverse as we would like to be. And, uh, you know, and that's, it's for all, all, you know, colors, not just black people, but Native Americans. And I think Native Americans are actually the lowest um, population in the CRNA community. I believe it's less than 1%. So just trying to get that exposure for people who don't look like the masses right. um, and, and letting them know that it is, this is doable and this is possible and getting that mentorship. So it's really about the mentorship. It's not like an automatic pass. Or I know right. there was one person who asked if it was anything related to affirmative action, but it's nothing like that. It's really just trying to prepare uh, minorities to say, this, these are the steps you need to take because, um, you know, we, when you don't have that representation, it's hard to kind of, right. you know, gauge oh, what yeah, needs to sure. be done. So yeah. um, it's, they have different events. They have symposiums for doctorates of, you know, anesthesia and, and PEs and PhDs. But the diversity uh, airway workshops are held, uh, I think, three or four times a year at different uh, schools. And it pretty much gives ICU nurses or um, nursing students um, kind of an inside look on what schools look for and what steps to take to get you prepared for applying to CRNA school and then awesome. it gives you an inside look into CRNAs and SRNAs to see kind of what that life is like. So it's cool. really a good networking experience and I think that it helped me a lot because I really had no no direction on what to do until I went there and I I made so many friends, people that, mm -hmm. you know, I've since since that journey have gotten to CRNA school and we kind of stay in touch to say I'm so That's proud nice. of you and you know we kind of built this this community. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really, really helpful. So anybody who is interested in going, I would definitely recommend just signing up for one that's local or maybe not even local and uh, just go, just go in and, and yeah. absorb as much as you can. That's awesome. I actually just saw they have one. Um, I'm in Ohio. 
but they have okay. one at Case Western Reserve, which again, I was kind of like, oh wow, so right here in Ohio they have one. Yeah. Um, all right, that's great. Well, thank you for sharing about that. Mm -hmm. So kind of tell me, um, I'm sorry, my handwriting's kind of sloppy. Oh, <laughs> so some advice on application. Um, what, what are some things you did to help you stand out? So I'm gonna say the biggest thing is to apply early. And I say this in some of my videos, you have to apply way before the deadline because schools are not waiting until the deadline to True. say, we want you to come in for interview. So your, your application may be interesting, but if they've already filled up all the slots, then sorry to you. So yeah, so definitely apply early. As far as standing out, um, you have to, uh, you got to think about yourself and what you really have to know yourself. So for me, I know that I'm, I'm pretty personable and I know, you know, some things that I do that people don't expect me to do like fish or um, I don't know, any, anything that's, that's relatable. Uh -huh. um, you want to put that in because they want to know you as a person. A lot of times we like to brag up on, I worked on the CV ICU, I worked at the ICU and we do all the things that everybody has done. And it's like, okay, I'm tired of reading about this. So um, definitely try to make it personable, but don't make it a sap story. Sometimes people try to pull on the heartstrings so much that they don't answer the question. Or, you know, it's not organized. And you talk about one thing here, and then you jump to something completely different in your next, you know, paragraph. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you really, um, you want to get personal, but not get distracted. Uh, okay. That's not, great. That's great. There's not really much besides that to stand out because everybody's going to have the same things. Right. Everybody's going to have. Right. No, but I like that. Make it personal. Yeah. They want to know who you are. I've heard that from right. a lot of committee members or the interview committee members. They want to know who you are as a person. Right. Um, and kind of, I even talked to another SRNA who um, kind of related it back to how she trained for a marathon. And so that was kind of something yep. she kind of tied in. So just things like that um, to show her hard work ethic and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, so also, I was going to ask you, how did you prepare for your interview? What, what kind of things did you look at and start um, doing to help prepare for your interview? So for my first interview, we'll talk about union, um, because I knew students who went there. Of course, you want to ask and try to get as much background as you can. What type of interview is it? What, what should I look for? You know, who's going to be there? <clears throat> Excuse me. You definitely want to know who's going to be on your, your board panel by, by name. You want to know first name, last name, title, whether it's doctor, professor, you don't want to mess that up. So um, I definitely wanted to show them that I, I did research in the school. So I knew all of the people that were on the interview panel by, by name. Um, and I shook everybody's hand. As far as preparing, um, if you do get insight onto your school's interview process or what they may ask or what type of interview it is, you want to prepare for it, but you don't want to try to memorize any answers because honestly, you're going to get in there and forget everything. So um, my best advice is to uh, talk in bullet points. When you're answering questions, don't write out a full paragraph. Do bullet points. Something that is uh, like a main point that you, you know will stick in your mind and then just let it flow like a regular conversation when you're in there because that's going to seem more natural. That's going to kind of capture their attention more than trying to read something verbatim off of a paper. Because okay. I tried both. And honestly, I'm telling you, I practiced for weeks. And uh, I was driving to the interview, and I'm like, damn it, I, why am I never remembering anything? But it's because I tried to remember verbatim. And then, I, and honestly, uh, I, yeah. my first interview, I, I didn't wing it. I knew what I was going to say, but I didn't have anything perfected down. Um, mm -hmm. So it really was very natural. So. Gotcha. Um, so is that first interview the what the school you got accepted into? I got waitlisted for that first school. Okay. And then I had another interview for uh, another school and uh, um, knew nothing about the school at all. So you, I said, you know what, I want to cover all my bases. So I did touch up on like medications and the patient population from my ICU just so I would have something to talk about because if you can't talk about your ICU, I don't know what to tell you. So, um, right. and the yeah. thing about that, you want to uh, only talk about the things that you know. So you don't want to try to sound, you know, like the smart person on the unit. <laughs> and then they ask you, okay, right. well, tell me about CRT. <laughs> and you, right. you don't know, you know, the first thing mm -hmm. from, from what. So stick to like two or three things that you're really comfortable with talking about, whether it's a medication or intervention or a patient population and run with that because they can only ask you about what you tell them. So. Right. I 100% agree with that one for yeah. sure. Um, I even think as uh, even like 
as an SRNA in clinical, same thing. Like, don't, I mean, it's one thing to kind of want to chat with the MD or the CRNA, but if anything comes out of your mouth, they're fair game for <laughs> mm -hmm. so. I'm going to remember that too. I'm going to remember that too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hopefully that one's nice, but you know, um, right. so, okay. So how did you prepare financially for school? So, um, I knew I was going to travel once I got in, once I got my yes, I said, I'm going to travel. I don't care where I'm at. I'm going to travel. So, uh, once I got my first acceptance, so that second school that I interviewed for, I got accepted into and I said, Oh, it's time to hit the bricks. So I actually, <laughs> uh, looked into like different travel agencies. Um, I wanted to go to California because everybody wants to travel in California. So, um, I landed a, a, an assignment in California and I just okay. saved, I saved, saved, saved. Well, so backtrack. I got to California. I started making way more money and I was spending more money. So I really wasn't saving <laughs> yeah. at first. So actually Crystal, Crystal uh, G, Crystal oh, yeah. Bennett, she, uh, I called her and I said, Crystal, I'm making more money, but I'm not saving anything. Like what am I doing wrong? So she, we literally, uh, sat down one day. We were at, we were in Augusta. So I had just interviewed for Augusta as well, but we were together and we went to her hotel room and sat down and literally planned out everything that I spent on food, nice. you know, bills. And um, we, she put me on like this strict budget. Like I'm not even going to lie. It was, it was crazy. And then a lot was going on. My car had got stolen around that time. So I oh. needed a new car and oh I was like, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna save up, you know, 10,000 and, and put down for a car. She was like, no, what you're gonna do is spend $2,500 on a car. And I was like, I can't do that. She's like, yes, you can. I'm like, no, I can't do this. So I talked her up to 5,000. So I bought a car cash. So I didn't have a car note. My insurance nice. wasn't as much. So those things kind of helped, but really it was the travel nursing and trying to live off of half of what I made and save the mm -hmm. other half and just try to pay off as many bills as I could, any debt. And um, I ended up saving some money for, for school now that I'm in school. So I have money saved. It's not as much as I would have had, but I did pay off a lot of stuff too, So uh, which I'm fine with. Um, but that was pretty much what I did. So I recommend traveling to anybody. Once you get accepted, travel. Awesome. Okay, that's great. And then are you planning on taking out loans for anything else that you need during Oh, yeah, the I took time? out the max. I took out the max of yeah. loans for everything. So <laughs> You'll be okay. I'm really so fearful <laughs> right. of that, but you're going to be okay. Yeah. I had $150,000. I've been yeah. out for five years. And I only have, like, less than 40000 left. Oh, wow. And that's with that's me not really even good. trying. Like, I have two kids, and I pay more in daycare than my mortgage, and I still have no problem paying off my student loan. So it'll be okay. Okay. But it All is right. painful. I'm good. I'm good. Yes. But you're going to be okay. All right, cool. So um, talk about that. Let's see. Oh, were you caught off guard by anything they asked you in the interview? Was there anything that you really weren't expecting them to ask you? Um, so the I remember one interview, they asked me, so what are you, what are you going to do if you don't get accepted? That kind of caught me off guard because um, I wasn't expecting that. And I mean, I mean you just, you just, be, oh, and also, um, what makes you stand out more than somebody else? So that question really tricked me up because I didn't know if I should like kind of brag about myself or not, or if I should right. kind of be modest. Mm -hmm. But no, you want to sell yourself. If they ask you that, that's game to sell yourself. And yeah. the way you do it is you kind of just keep the focus on yourself. So you tell them, you know what, well, I'm not sure what everybody else has to offer, but this is what I bring to this program. And yeah. you just hit okay. all of your points. Don't be afraid to really sell yourself. Yeah. Um, so that caught me off guard. There was another question they asked me. Um, it wasn't anything clinical. It was, it was all personal that I wasn't expecting. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember right now, but... Um, it's okay. it was nothing I, clinical. Yeah. Yeah. The, for me, I always, cause I mean, I went to two different interviews by far. The personal questions are the hardest ones. Yep. Um, just, I mean, the pathophys farm, you can study that it's black and yep. white, you know, personal is kind of like, well, <laughs> so, right. but yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, do you have any questions for me about anything? I know. Um, um hmm, let's see. <laughs> what questions do I have? Uh oh. <laughs> uh, oh, well, but, well, I did have one question that somebody sure. DM'd me. They asked if I was going to continue to do the SRNA trip while I'm in school. I do plan on doing it. It probably won't be as often because, let me tell right. you, they're already slapping <laughs> us across the room now with the pages upon pages. So, but I do plan on continuing like every everything that's going on. Great. Um, 
I'm sure people will love to see your journey through school. It's yeah, gonna be yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna I'm gonna jazz it up. And when you get to that burnout point, you see your burnout in your eyes. Yes, <laughs> and you 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 guys are gonna see it just as yeah. well as I will. So the don't students worry. come in, they're always so hyper and excited and like ready to get in there. And then yep. like the year in, they're like, you know, you can tell they're surviving on coffee and yep. cap, you know, but it's okay. You'll get re fall back on your classmates and yeah. whatever support system you have, just utilize that like like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So, but you'll be okay. So, and that's why every, everybody's here. Like I think majority of the class is here now. We kind of wanted just to get together and still, cause we're still getting to know each other. I don't remember anybody's name. So, well, I remember some people's names, but not everybody. But I, I remember their faces, but I'm still putting names to, to faces. So um, I think that this is good that we got together um, now to kind of really Definitely. tie everything in. Um, but what what was your um, what was your study schedule like? Because I, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. Because honestly, um, it's going to be a lot. I don't study at night. I'm not a big nighttime studier, so I'd rather go to bed early and oh, then yeah. wake up I early. So sleep. yeah, me too. I mean, yeah. yeah. And so, this is probably the best I'm going to look all semester. I'm just letting you guys know that because I. I just don't have time, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I totally feel you. I, you know, things were a lot different for me back then. I obviously, I didn't have any kids. So um, I, you know, I have ideas on how things would have changed if I would have done it now. But ultimately what I did um, was I cut off, I cut off my study time by 10 p.m. Um, sometimes right. it was 9 p.m. So I actually commuted two hours to go to class. So we would get up, we would all get together around 6 a.m. We'd get on the road, we'd get to class by 8 a.m. We'd have class till three thirty four p.m. and then we drive back to Columbus, which is two hours. So we get home wow. around, you know, you know, like five or six p.m. and I would spend from six p.m. to eight p.m. doing my care plans and trying to study whatever I could. Maybe that last after I would relax, have some dinner, I would maybe spend the last forty five minutes just doing some studying or whatever I had to do. And that was my Monday through Friday. Um, yeah. Now on the weekends, I utilized all day on the, like pretty much all day Saturday all day Sunday about six six to eight hours I would study on the weekends now don't get me wrong I still made some time for some family events and some fun yeah. things but I said no to a lot of things and I remember my husband always being like oh, he didn't he didn't he get invited to go do something with a group of friends or something uh -huh. so he'd be like so do you want to do this and I'm like oh like you know I want to but you know the answer is no right it's no I thought I said no all the time and it was so painful yeah. but it's just what you have to do. Um, but I, most of my weekends was study time. And then if I um, had a day where I had a clinical and not class, this class was class was a long day. Yeah. And typically at the end of the program, I had class one or two days a week, and then I had clinical the rest of the time. My clinical days were eight hours, so I'd get there around 6 a.m. and I'd leave by 3.30, not that that's eight hours, but I would usually get there around 6.30, 6 or 6.30, depending on where I was going. Right. Um, and I'd be done by three or three thirty. Some days you got out at two, but some days you got stuck till five p.m. So it just kind yeah. of depends. And the latest I ever stayed yeah. was eight p.m. And that was to finish a really big case that I felt like I had to stay and finish. But yeah. most of the time you're out by three thirty. And then um, I would then go to the gym. And I actually had, I always did it in my BSM. But I actually would take my notes. And if I found an arc trainer, <laughs> not that you want to do arc <laughs> trainers, but I found an arc trainer, I wasn't too bouncy, so right. I could actually study. And I've know what it is but something about working out and studying that helped me retain it better um mm -hmm. so i would listen to music and i would study my notes and just go through all my powerpoint slides for, from class that week um and i did that at the gym for almost an hour three to four times a week so not only did it keep me in really good shape but i was also able to study you were still studying and that's a yes. good point because what i do what i did in my bsn is i would listen to my lectures over but i would be yeah. fishing like i would be out doing something totally random and, and just listen to my lectures before yeah. like a test or anything so that helps out a lot but two hours drive to, to class that's yeah. that's crazy but we would use it for study time okay so like it was me and four other people we all carpooled and we would quiz each other so like we had a test it was like awesome because we would study obviously right. the night before before we went to bed and then we would get up and get in the car and then we would just do a study session the whole way there so we had some fun time but we mostly studied and would quiz each other the whole way there and if for some reason we weren't carpooling, um, I would replay my notes, like what you said on my car, and I would yeah. listen to my notes and record lecture and things like that. Um, Valley had some recordings that I used. I mean, I, there's always ways to study if you don't actually can't sit and read a textbook. Yeah. Um, I would even bring flashcards to clinical with me. Like the, I think I had Memory Master, but I don't know, Apex might. I have Memory Master too. Was that Valley, right? Valley? 
Valley, Memory Master, yeah, yeah that was yeah. big. That and Prodigy were big when I was in school. But now I think yeah. Apex is... Um, Apex is kind of like taking the lead. But I did win yeah. uh, Valley, M Memory Master. Like, yes. I don't know how I won it, but I won one. And it's actually oh, really good. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm gonna oh, yeah. It. It's, it's really good. It's, yeah. it's very good. It's very great. So I would take things like that to clinical if I had any downtime at all or if I had a case where it was kind of, you know, a big case where you're going to have a decent amount of downtime. I probably wouldn't do that initially as a new SRNA, but yeah. as you get more experience as like a senior SRNA, if you have a robotic case that's boring, all you do is push occasional paralytic if, or nothing. If that matter, yeah. you just sit there and you're like, it's dark, I'm going to fall asleep. You can bring <laughs> your flashcards and study. Um, right. So yeah, there's there's ways. But yeah, ultimately, you use your time after clinical, get some exercise, do something, do something for you because you need that. Yeah. You can't forget that. Do your fishing, workout, whatever it is, but then take you know, two or three hours to do your care plans and study. I think two or three hours a night, maybe three would probably be as much as you need. Yeah. Um, and, and as long as you're willing to make up for it on the weekends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so some, that's good because somebody just asked that question, how many hours a day should I expect to study? So, um. Because you learn a lot when you're in clinical. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously your class day, it's like you're bombarded all day, eight hours of class. How much more are you going to really learn that day? It's like your brain yeah. almost can, can't take it anymore. So for me, I had to go home from class after, and usually on the car rides home from class, we didn't really do a lot of studying. It was mostly on the way there we would study. On the yeah. way home, we just chit-chatted. We'd even go to the bar after class and get drunk sometimes and then go home. Like, I mean, like, that's what we did. Right. We had Taco Bell and, you know, had fun with that. So we, we didn't, like, we didn't go all out all the time. It's just not possible. You need that yeah. relax, that mental break. Um, so, again, I probably spent, you know, anywhere between, like, 6 to 9 p.m., between my husband, my lovely husband would cook dinner and things like that. And I would do most of my studying and things. And then when dinner was ready, I'd go eat dinner and then I'd go back to my studies. Um, but I didn't have kids. You know, I think if you had kids, this, I'm going to talk to Amber next, but um, yeah, it would be different as far as your schedule goes. But you just do Absolutely. the best you can. Yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to try. Let's, we'll see. I got to get this study schedule down. But I mean, it's the, literally the first day that we've gotten anything, any instruction to read or do anything. So seven chapters really for two quizzes next week but in all with all all of my classes i think it's about mm, nine chapters and like a powerpoint okay. plus the powerpoints that they haven't even released right. yet so it's it's like yeah and I you're want. gonna feel overwhelmed for a while but yes. i promise you a month or two from now you're like okay i think you kind of learn and I told someone else, when you get into school, you just become like a robot. You just do mm -hmm. it. You just get the work done. You don't even have time to, like, question or think or complain. You just simply just get the motion of doing things. And initially, it's going to take – it's going to be overwhelming. And you're always going to be overwhelmed. But you get used to that being overwhelmed. You get used to that overwhelmed feeling, and you just kind of just get it done. Yeah. You know, it's like any task that's put in front of you, get it done, move on. Get it done, move on. Get it done. You just – that's what you do. Yeah. You know, so. And honestly, I feel like that's another reason why it's so important to have – such a high level of uh, ICU experience because you know that stress on the ICU. You know about oh, yeah. ripping and running all day, going back and forth between each room. And like you said, you kind of just deal with it. It's kind of expected, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a long day. We got this in here. We got this in here. This patient family yeah. is going to bug me all day. So you know that stress. So that's that's a good point as well, just to get used to the stress. That's what wine is for, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what so, wine is for. Absolutely. Yes, I drank a lot in school. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. So I, there's one more question here. How diverse is your class, PJ? This is Mel. Um, so we have a class of 31, I believe. It's 31. That's a big I one. don't know everybody's ethnicities. There are seven African Americans out of 31. Um, so honestly, I think that, I feel like that's a pretty big number mm -hmm. um, compared to some schools. So I know at the, my first school that I got accepted into, I was the only one, but I was only out of 10. So, um, you know, it, it, it varies, but that's that's how many African-Americans. I don't know about anybody else's diversity. I don't think we have any, yeah. like, Asian-Americans or, like, Pacific Islanders, not that I know of. So, I mean, yeah. See, we had a class of 42, which was the big, biggest oh class God. I ever yeah. had. Yeah. yeah, it was a big class. Um, we only had two African-Americans, yeah. but... Um, we had a few other ethnicities. I don't know exactly what they were, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was mostly Caucasian people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in the age range varied anywhere from, I think one girl was like 24. She was really young. And then yeah. the oldest we had was 52. I think a lot of most, if not all, there's a couple are uh, in our 20s. Yeah, there's a lot okay. of 20s. Um, there are some older 
20s to like a little bit older. I'm not sure which. I don't think I would tell even if I did know. So I don't want to get in trouble with <laughs> nobody. Tell anybody's That's age. That's right. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we, we're mostly in the 20s. Um, I think a lot of us have been nurses for um, two to seven, two to five, two to seven, something like that. Yeah. Seven years. So, yeah. you know, it just goes to show you don't need a bunch of experience to go back right. to school. Yeah. Right. So. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And I'll let you get back to socializing and having fun with your classmates. Yes. Crystal's on here. Hey, Crystal, I'll see you soon. <laughs> and uh, hey, everybody, for, for joining. And uh, thank you, Jenny, for having me. This is yes. great. No and, problem. Um, Remind me of your YouTube channel. It's called The Drip SRNA. The SRNA Drip. Oh, SRNA Drip. Okay. Yes, thank you. I just want to make sure everyone yes. knew that. Yes. You guys, Absolutely. check him out. He's awesome. He has a lot of great content on there already for you. And again, thank you so much. And I look thank forward you, to you. seeing you in my community on Facebook. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know I'll be in there. So. Yes. Um, we'll talk. Okay, sounds good.